I can never tell when we're going live, but uh, welcome everybody to this week's live episode of the Modern Pain Podcast. Uh, we're going live this week with uh, Nick Rolnick, who's a, a social media friend. Nick, I don't think we've ever, ever actually been in the same spot together, but maybe one of these days when... Here's a LaCroix. Cheers. Nice. Getting fancy tonight, I like. It. Uh, but yeah, this is our first uh, live podcast in a while. And if for the for those of you who are watching live, I uh, would love to see if you have any questions or comments as we're talking to Nick. Uh, he's an expert in blood flow restriction uh, treatments, so in interventions, and we're going to be talking a lot about that. We also have Nick coming on our Lifelong Learning Academy this month to deliver a masterclass where he's going to go uh, into a lot of the nuts and bolts of it, um, and has some you know some special surprises for the folks in our our membership. So we're excited to have him here. But before we uh, get to Nick, let's uh, see what Jared Hall's up to. Don't mean to ignore you, Jared, but how are you doing tonight? Man, I'm doing good. Uh, you know, just a long, busy day in the clinic today, which, uh, you know, since I moved a little bit more over into kind of mentorship management, you know, wear a lot of different hats. It's actually been nice. I've been in the clinic all week this week. Uh, and I haven't, I haven't had a 40 hour uh, patient load in, um, you know, a few months. So it's, it's been cool to get back in there full time and, uh, you know, remember, re remember what it's like to stand on your feet for uh, 12 hours in a day. You know, my, my feet are feeling it today. If I, if I'm being honest. Dogs are barking. Yeah, no, yeah. it's, it's uh, getting to be a cold face again. Good for you, man. Getting get out of that administrative uh, white collar world. Good stuff. Uh, so, Nick, man, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Uh, Jared and I know of you, and we have great respect for what you're doing in the BFR world, but some of the folks maybe um, who are new to you might not know uh, about you. So do you mind introducing yourself for everybody? Sure. Thanks, everyone, for, uh, for having me on. I always enjoy the opportunity to slide on in and uh, talk some BFR and uh, try to give people some idea of what evidence-based BFR application likely, likely is. Um, but for those who don't know who I am, my name is Nicholas Rolnick. I am an orthopedic physical therapist. I have my own practice in Manhattan, uh, Midtown Manhattan. And I see just, you know, I'll be honest, I just see you know, people with disposable income, wealthy, wealthy businessmen, executives, um, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it here. Like it is what it is. Uh, and, uh, but it's great because they saw, they have problems too. They have goals they want to achieve. Um, a lot of times the, the, the healthcare system has failed them. And so it's my job to really uh, rectify the mistakes of uh, others and try to get them on the path toward uh, towards wellness and health and back to activities that they love as quickly as humanly possible. And blood flow restriction just happens to be one of those uh, ways in which I can and integrate into their plan of care uh, because of the unique benefits that BFR can uh, provide to a plan of care. Uh, for those not familiar, I hope some people have, at least now in 2021, people are somewhat familiar with the term BFR, blood flow restriction, uh, but blood flow restriction involves use of a cuff applied to the proximal most port, part of the limb and uh, with, with restricting blood flow and occluding venous return, you can accelerate the fatigue process and potentially some other really cool things uh, that low load alternatives or even potentially high load alternatives can't necessarily do as effectively. Um, but it's a very early, uh, although rapidly growing area of research uh, with hundreds of papers uh, published so far. Um, and we can talk about the, the limitations in the research uh, body because there are quite a few. But um, in doing so with my BFR interests, I have an education company called the BFR Pros. And the BFR Pros, our mission really is to just spread BFR. And uh, I basically, we run workshops uh, for clinics, uh, in-person workshops, at least in the past, we were doing in-person workshops pre-COVID. Um, and because clinicians are, are recognizing, and especially clinic chains are recognizing that uh, BFR is coming, the demand is growing, and they want to be there to meet the demand. Surgeons are now uh, specifically asking for BFR in plans of care, and thus these clinics are now saying, if I'm not doing BFR, I'm even missing out on that business. 
And um, we're seeing that, especially in the major metropolitan areas like Manhattan. And so more people now are looking to get trained. Um, but I also understand that there's a lot of different ways in which you can perform BFR. And a lot, every, it's not even a lot, every uh, in-person workshop uh, is always affiliated with a cuff manufacturer. And so I saw that as an opportunity to bring some really unbiased education uh, and application to the education game. And thus that's where the BFR pros sits. And very fortunate that we have international relationships. I go to Europe uh, at least two or three times a year pre-COVID. Uh, and now we're going to renew that, that agreement at some point uh, this year. And that'll be in for the next three or four years um, where I get to teach European physios how to do BFR, which is awesome because I'm shaping practice in Europe because Europe BFR is kind of wide open. In the United States, it's been pioneered by Johnny Owens, uh, brought it back. And you might've heard of some of the amazing anecdotal stories with BFR, like with Alex Smith, for example, um, coming back, he, he attributes uh, a large portion of his ability to recover, obviously to the surgeons who did a great job, but also in his rehab uh, by aim, being able to stress his muscles uh, at very light, light weights and uh, being able to uh, get him back to playing football, uh, which is pretty wild. And uh, maybe Tiger Woods might be, you know, a potential, <laughs> a potential uh, candidate for some BFR uh, as well. Uh, but it's great. I mean, I, I, I love what I do. I, I also am a published author in the space. Uh, probably by the end of this year, probably will have at least six to eight articles that have been published in, in journals. And uh, I just love it. It's great because it's, it's something unlike some of these modalities that we've or you've probably talked about in the past, uh, there is some very sound theoretical science to support its efficacy, along with now more and more clinical trials are coming up that are showing its superiority to at least this, the normal stuff that we'd be doing in the clinic, um, which is again, uh, another discussion entirely about dosing uh, appropriately uh, with our patients, but um, showing that it has some efficacy and, and some significant promise and can offer some unique benefits to, uh, to physical therapists and other rehab providers. Um, so, you know, that's kind of it. And then for those that are watching live, this is my Frenchie. Uh, there we go. <laughs> She's sleeping. Um, that's her little snuggle buddy. And uh, yeah. So if anybody has any questions, uh, it's hanging out live or whatnot, uh, be happy to answer. So. I mean, I'm, I'll go ahead and jump in there with a couple of questions. I mean, you mentioned that there are there, there are already hundreds of research articles published, and I know that you've published a little bit, and you have several coming down the pipeline. Um, I just did a research review on uh, yours and, and Brad Schoenfeld's uh, 2020 article on uh, the applications of BFR for the physique athlete. And, uh, it, you know, I really liked it because it dove deep into a lot of the theoretical mechanisms underlying muscle hypertrophy and, you know, what role BFR plays and especially like creating the hypoxic environment, cell swelling and, and that sort of stuff. Um, but since, you know, Mark and I have a, have a heavily um, biased rehab crowd, uh, I was hoping that you would like on the fly kind of spin some of that information to see it see it apply in rehab rather than just for a physique athlete. I mean, obviously I can see those parallels, but I think hearing it from the horse's mouth, somebody that walks in both worlds uh, in the physique athlete and the, you know, the training world that you've spent a lot of time in as well as uh, from the rehab perspective. Yeah. I mean, so that, that article was a vehicle to get kind of my current thoughts on paper about application of BFR. So there is, for anybody that's interested in learning about blood flow restriction, I think the first article that I would, that I would refer them to would be Patterson A.L.'s 2019 paper in Frontiers in Physiology. That had 13 of the, 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 the I would say the, if you're ranking researchers or, or the, the, the big time researchers that have published a lot in the space had them on a paper and they came to a consensus about the, the current body of literature and then what recommendations there are to practice. Um, and, but in my you know, perusing the, 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 the literature, 
there was really never anything that was like an applied paper. There was like a lot of things like, oh yeah, like this should be done or that should be done, but there was nothing that really was, was able to, to take it from the evidence, but also practical based evidence as well. Like it, it, it's really important as well to, to, to think, to understand that, you know, practice-based evidence is also important in my opinion, as long as it's based in some knowledge of what we currently understand about hypertrophy and, and applications, et cetera. So this paper was just important. It was a vehicle to get that into the literature, but the same principles apply to rehab. Um, the difference though, is obviously when you're working with healthy individuals uh, that are looking to optimize their muscle mass, um, you know, there, there's a little bit of an aesthetic goal to that, or it's almost all aesthetic, right? You can get some, a little, some strength, but really in reality, it's all about aesthetics. But if you transition that to the rehab space, I don't think people, physical therapists, chiropractors, rehab in general, understand how quickly we tend to lose muscle mass and we tend to lose now other tissues that we weren't even thinking about. Like, for example, this paper is up and coming and it was cited in my, um, my online course, which I didn't say, I also have a four and a half hour online course, right? If you're interested in, 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 in learning about that. But um, we're learning now that all, basically all of our tissues are affected by disuse. So we don't use them, we lose them. Our vascular tissue tends to go kaput. Our tendons tend to lose stiffness, right? And that, that influences our ability to generate force. Now we're learning that postoperatively in ACLs that actually they, we lose bone mineral density as well, um, which is actually the first finding uh, that, that, they, that they've seen in that. And that BFR can actually prevent that atrophy or that, atten that, that uh, loss of bone mass from occurring, which is awesome. Um, but that paper then, that same principles apply, but now you just shift it more toward, all right, instead of looking at maybe 20 to 50%, we're looking more at zero to 20% initially, right? We're just getting them, getting the cuffs on and then applying that and grading them up. But the same principles apply in, in, in that paper. Um, but getting back to what I was saying before is that disuse happens pretty damn quickly, right? One day we're good. Two days we start to get changes in our insulin sensitivity. Right. That's that's not a good that's not a good sign. By up to four or five days, we're starting to see some actual atrophy occur in quads. And this is in healthy people that can be immobilized, just giving them on a uh, giving them on a uh, on a crutches, for example. So we lose muscle pretty damn quickly. Um, but if we can actually get muscle back. Right. My philosophy and what I've seen and in the majority of the studies that I've read is, is that when we can grow muscle, right? That usually coincides with a lot of the other beneficial changes that happen in our body, right? We get increased capillarization. We can get increased tendon stiffness, right? And again, I say the tendon stiffness is because we have preliminary evidence right now from, from Christoph Sentner back in, in, in Germany, where they actually compared, you know, low, low BFR to heavy load strength training in calves and showed similar mechanical changes in terms of the Achilles stiffness, as well as muscle mass changes, um, in the gastroc, uh, with a 14 week program. Um, so we're, we're kind of learning different, you know, ways in which this, this BFR stimulus can, can challenge our body our understanding of, of physiology as it is. And now with this upcoming paper, we look at bone. Um, so if we can grow muscle and we can focus on that process and we can accelerate that process, we can potentially, Right, mitigate a lot of the long-term issues that we may see following post-surgical rehab. Now, ACLs are plagued with long-term quadriceps, you know, atrophy and or changes in central activation or changes in uh, ability or ability to hop, you know, all these different functional outcome scores that we, we want to reduce or, or improve to reduce the risk of re-injury in, in the future. So that paper that I wrote, can be literally applied. It's just, again, you just scale down the, the percentages of the one RM, right? And then you try to get them to that 20% as quickly as possible. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I tried to give as much context as possible to what we think is the most plausible mechanisms that are underlying the benefits of BFR. Because you know what the funny thing is? Like we think of hypoxia, and, and this is where, you know, I'm kind of in the weeds here, but 
we think hypoxia is, you know, is like, oh yeah, because we're, 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 we're occluding. But actually in reality, what's happening with the venous occlusion is that we're just allowing these metabolites to hang out in, in the cell. And when they hang out in the cell, that actually creates some localized fatigue. And that fatigue becomes accelerated. And thus, basically every rep that you do with BFR might be two or three reps that you do without BFR. So you can accelerate the process and you'll get to the same end game, at least from a muscle hypertrophy perspective um, as low load training, but you'll do it quicker. And that could open up a lot of opportunities when you're working with, with rehab clients. Um, so that was kind of the, the, the focus of that paper, which is at least get it in there. And now one of the other things we're working on is something more specific to rehab that's in the, uh, that's in the works. So. Nice. We'll, we'll, we'll be waiting for, for you to release that to the world. And uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll be letting folks know on, on the good old soul. <laughs> Everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so, so being a older curmudgeon clinician who sometimes is resistant to change and, and uh, you know, but definitely obviously uh, wouldn't be here if we weren't, uh, you know, if I wasn't interested in, in BFR and things, but so, say I'm a curmudgeon clinician who's just, you know, I don't need another tool in the toolbox. It's just another more flashy modality that's going to come and go. What makes BFR something that's going, in your mind, something that's, uh, a, you know, a intervention that should be part of the everyday clinicians, uh, I'll say toolbox, although we, we may not love all that terminology, but um, yeah. it's, it's, most, should... it's the most colloquially accepted, right? Tool in the toolbox. Like, I think I use that in the course too. Do I think I really like, you, you, I hate that term, but like, it's the most yeah. relatable. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's another way to address a problem. I mean, you go and, and you're like, listen, you know what, you know what people, people are shocked when I, when I tell them that my practice, I probably use BFR on only 40 to 50, maybe percent of the patients, given that I speak about it all the time and all of its benefits. Um, it's just, sometimes you don't need to use BFR, but in cases where you have a very resistant, um, and, and like pay, like for example, like, like, like leg extension, like a knee extension, you're like, you're just not getting what you need to get out of the knee, either through pain, right. Loading intolerance or like long-term issues. So like somebody post-op ACL, like two or three years can give them all the knee extensions you want, but for whatever reason, they're not responding. It, it's amazing how you can just change up the stimulus a little bit and it, they end up responding beautifully. Like it's one of those things, like it's it, the research you can say, all right, like there is the research of hypertrophy where, you know, we do have some evidence showing long-term uh, long post-op ACL. That was, it was a, a author by the name of Kilgas, K-I-L-G-A-S, looked at long-term quadriceps uh, post-op ACL and had them just add a home exercise program with BFR and showed significant improvements in LSI uh, in terms of muscle mass and, and muscle strength. Um, but these people were doing stuff beforehand, right? Sometimes the body just needs another way to approach the problem. Is it the only way? No, but it's a nice way to say, hey, listen, if you're not getting what I need to get in, in, in approaching it with a traditional strength training model, for example, if you're, you're looking at that longstanding quad, uh, quad uh, issue, then this might be an alternative for you to, to look into. Um, and I think another area that is very, 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 uh, or is going to be more, more studied and, and now starting to have more and more uh, evidence to support that is its pain relieving effects uh, over low intensity exercise alone, and even comparable to or exceeding high intensity training. Um, sometimes like, for example, like you can get some pain relief just by moving, right? Like you move, it feels better. Um, but the earlier recruitment of those type two muscle fibers uh, is one of the theorized mechanisms as to why they can get some, some pain, additional pain relief along with the CPM condition pain, uh, condi condition pain modulation uh, with like the intense discomfort that you get from BFR and you just get some really, really, really nice pain relief uh, that you don't necessarily get with a low load training. Like I've had people try to do the same thing. And again, Anecdotal experiences are great. Obviously, you want to be you want to be rooted in some form of research. Which you know, we have the first body, uh, first uh, paper that was looking at the mechanistic underpinnings of pain relief 
uh, by Hughes last year. And they basically had individuals perform a leg press 30% of the one RM compared to, I think 70% or 80% of, of heavy load training. And they looked at PP, PP uh, pain pressure threshold uh, as well as I can't remember the other one, but basically they looked at the pressure responses 40 and 80% compared to low intensity training compared to high intensity training. And they saw that um, more discomfort led to higher relief in terms of, of, of pain, uh, hypoalgesia. And uh, while 40% was pretty good, 80% was better, right? The more discomfort that you have. And then they were looking at um, the endocannabinoid system and showing that that also has a, some relationship to the pain relief, uh, pain relieving response or endogenous opioids. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things like it wouldn't hurt to use. Like what we're learning now is, is research is supporting that it doesn't elevate clot risk. There was just a paper published literally this morning, which I'm trying to get a hold of, of women with diabetes um, showing that they actually did not have an exaggerated pressure response, meaning that they didn't have exaggerated high, blo uh, high blood pressure uh, with use of the BFR stimulus. So it's, uh, it's very interesting to see kind of what's going on uh, as it moves forward. But yeah, as technology becomes more and more available, the cheaper it's going to get and thus the more accessible. Right now, the technology is such that it's very, very, very expensive uh, if you're trying to use the top end device. Um, and the lower end devices, I think personally for me, my line in the sand is we need to have a personalized pressure. If you do not have a personalized pressure, that can change the perceptual and, and cardiovascular responses to the BFR stimulus. And, you know, from a liability perspective, you want to at least adhere to what that, for example, the Patterson AL paper uh, was talking about, which is, should be standardized to, to the individual. Um, so to long-winded answer your question, Mark, that, that is part of it, but also, hey, listen, as I said before, BFR is coming. Surgeons are now trying to, uh, are now seeing more papers in their journals that are supporting its use. And so if you're looking to keep business and not have business go elsewhere, you know, you'd be, you'd be, you'd be wise to at least give it a look. Yeah, I think Mark, Mark was just saying that we had some questions popping in on Facebook. I think some people are interested in, in asking a few things. Yeah, so Mike Velasquez asked, have there been other protocols looked at in the research aside from the oh. typical 30, 15, 15, 15? Oh. So that's one of the heterogeneities that's, that, that's a problem. Uh, when you're trying to do research. So for example, like I've, I, there have been as protocols using three sets of 15, using sets to failure, using the 30, 15, 15, 15, using 30, 15, 15. There is ones that using uh, just, just three minutes of contractions on a cadence, it's all over the place. And that's a problem with the, the BFR literature as it currently stands is because not only do you have differences in resistance training protocols, but now you have differences in how they're prescribing pressure. So what we do know is that the higher the pressure, right, the, the more discomfort that individual experiences, the larger the cardiovascular and hemodynamic responses are to that stress. So if you're looking at trying to compare, you're tr you, when you're trying to do these large like systematic reviews and meta-analyses, like when I was on, I was on one about central hemodynamics, like the, 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 the aortic response to BFR. Literally, the five papers that met our inclusion criteria, they all had different protocols, different ways to prescribe pressure. So you're literally, even though they're all studies using BFR, it's comparing apples to oranges. What we want to do is compare apples to apples. How do we do that? Well, in the research, what we should do is one of two things. We should adopt a standard resistance training protocol, right? That could be 30, 15, 15, 15, right? Because that's been done a lot, or at least it's, it's starting to be done more. Believe it or not, like uh, there's only 52 papers as of 20, I think it's 2020, uh, when, this, when this was reviewed, uh, that have used limb occlusion pressure to, to standardize. The rest the hundreds of different other studies have used arbitrary pressure. They've used systolic blood pressure, brachial systolic blood pressure. Um, they've used uh, just giving the same pressure to every single individual. 
Um, they view like all these weird things that I'll, don't allow us to accurately compare the relative intensities between the different exercises. So I'm okay with the 30, 15, 15, 15 in the research, right? And then sets to failure, right? Because the sets to failure will give us an absolute as to if we're tr trying to compare low intensity training to low intensity training with BFR, right? And that's how we know we can pretty much state definitively that the same um, the same outcomes with low intensity training, you're going to get with low intensity training with BFR in terms of hypertrophy, right? Because they've done enough of those where it's like, okay, that makes sense. Now, the next question to hype up the, the, the masterclass next week is, so if we're getting the same results with, with, with BFR and then without BFR in terms of hypertrophy, then what, what does that likely say about the mechanisms that are underpinning the adaptation or, or the, the, the fire to create that adaptation in, in resistance training. Um, but in practice, let me tell you, like once you understand what's going on with BFR and what it does, right? And then you have a general understanding of what happens when you exercise a BFR, that is a slightly elevated uh, systolic, diastolic blood pressure, uh, heart rate response is gonna increase larger amounts of, of, of exertion, discomfort, muscle pain, like that muscle burn. Um, and then that might be exaggerated in individuals that have medical comorbidities like obesity, diabetes, although now I'm putting a question mark there, at least in, the, in women in that study, I have to read it, um, hypertension. Then you know that that response is gonna be a little bit exaggerated. And then you have to understand then, well, what increases blood pressure response? What increases, well, single, to multi-joint, larger range of motion, and all those things that I said in, you know, basically to progress exercise in that are all the things that are gonna increase the cardiovascular and hemodynamic responses to BFR exercise, right? So, um, so yeah, in practice, do I use the 30, 15, 15, 15 all the time? No, because you don't have to. Even if you use three sets of 10, right? I tell the clinicians if you if that, I, that I train, if you listen, if you don't, don't listen to anything I say, but then at least understand that you can take LOP and you want to do your three sets of 10, do three sets of 10 and slap on the BFR cuffs, all right? At least that you're, you're now increasing the, the, the potential benefit of your exercise intervention with, by adding the BFR cuffs on. So again, a long-winded answer of like, yes, the heterogeneity in the research is, out, is, is, is amazing and how crazy the, and that's just talking about the pressure and that's talking about the prescription. That's not talking about the cuff, right? That's another, that's another completely, you know, uh, variable that you need to account for when you're talking about BFR. Um, so. I have another question from uh, Brett Halpert playing devil's advocate, the highest level of evidence to date, correct me if I'm wrong, is the systematic review from BJSM a few years back in their conclusion, they, which Limited one? Which one is that? Uh, I'll have to look. Honestly, uh, if, if Brett, if you're still listening, uh, give us the old citation in the comments, and I'll pass it to Nick. But in their conclusion, they limited their language to more effective than low load strengthening. However, I don't buy much into the effectiveness of low load strengthening unless it's to buy a slight advantage when you can't load more, such as post op thoughts. I, I don't see the the harm in that statement. Um, I think that there are some unique effects. So if you're talking purely about hypertrophy, yeah, I would agree with that statement. Like, as I said before, about 40 to 40, 40 to 50% of my clients are using BFR in some capacity. Um, that's less than half um, are using BFR. Why? Because they can lift heavier. The problem is you're, you're gonna be load compromised. If you're in rehab, you will have a load compromised patient at some point in time. So why not try to accelerate, uh, prevent disuse atrophy, Right, or mitigate tissue atrophy, which happens quickly. It starts on day two, day three, right? We start to experience the negative changes that happen with disuse. And that doesn't even, that's including like just ambulating and having a, a leg in a cast, right? Not moving. Um, so, so you can't just look at it like from a strengthening perspective. You have to look at it from a metabolic and systemic health perspective and understand that the framework is different. Like, obviously I love big biceps, like, like I literally am seeing one person right now who just wants 17 inch biceps. He comes to see me four times a week, right? Literally that's our goal, but aesthetics are great, but you have to think about it in the greater scheme of systemic and metabolic health. We know that everything deteriorates pretty quickly, vascular tissue, 
bone, tendon, right? Muscle, all these cardiovascular capacity, obviously is, is, is another uh, factor as well as strength. Right. So yes, if it's, if we can do something that's superior to low load, absolutely. And we, we should do that whenever we have a low compromised patient. Right. So I agree with you. I think that's a perfectly valid statement. And if you take, if you take my course, you'll understand that's exactly what I say throughout the entire course. BFR is a bridge to heavy load strength training. However, there are cases by which, and research studies that, that have shown that well-trained athletes using BFR, like collegiate football players, for example, just adding additional volume to their program with BFR improves their strength, muscle mass, or both, right? And I talked about some of those papers in the, um, in the, the, the review that Jared did uh, on my physique paper, right? So you can't discount the fact that, that this stimulus is, is a potentially unique stimulus that can be a great add-on to that. Not to mention that there is a powerlifting study that uh, was looking at uh, was looking at high frequency, which is again a, a fatigue discussion, right? But they were using five times a week uh, BFR. I think they only did two weeks of BFR, but five times a week, but split over six weeks, and they showed uh, type one fiber hypertrophy, which we don't normally get in uh, in you know strength training. And so that conclusion, uh, even though I let it into the paper, uh, the more and more I think about it, the more and more I'm actually convinced that it was a frequency problem that's eliciting that. Like if you look at very high frequency programs, you're going to elicit very high levels of, of central fatigue and thus blunt motor unit recruitment. So you see that basically the type one muscle fibers will take over. At least that's my hypothesis um, because you're now blunting the, the type two muscle fiber recruitment. Again, stuff that I talk about a little bit in the master class. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no. And then you have the aerobic component, right? You have the, like being able to, so vascular shear stress is, is a large stimulator for angiogenesis and vascular genesis. You don't normally get that. You, you can get that with aerobic training, obviously, but once you get reach a threshold of, of adaptation, you need to now put another cog in the wheel. And there was a brilliant couple papers um, one by uh, Christensen and one by Ferguson, lead authors. And Christensen has some amazing stuff. Uh, if you're really interested in understanding the like really, really, really like nitty gritty physiology. Um, but they hypothesize and they show that, um, that, that there might be in these very high trained athletes, BFR is an adjunct to high intensity training to further promote these adaptations, this vascular shear stress, this hypoxia that can drive more angiogenesis, more so than the normal training program. Um, so don't discount and view BFR as just a, a hypertrophy. And that's not even talking about ischemic pre and post condition, that we can talk about changing the recruitment thresholds for some of these higher threshold motor units by, again, we don't necessarily know for sure, but we're seeing that we have increased time to uh, exhaustion. We have a decreased lactate release at submaximal exercise intensities. These are all things that have been shown and repeat IPC tends to be better than initial IPC. And that was literally just released uh, out of Patterson, uh, Patterson's lab uh, like a month ago. So it's like, it, it, you can't just look at BFR as low intensity exercise. That is most well-known and well-studied component. But I think that's selling the, the, the approach short um, on its potential benefits, uh, for rehab. And again, remember you have a low compromised patient, get them walking on a, on, on the treadmill with BFR, right? You, you have them warm up, right? Have them warm up 10 minutes walking on, on, on BFR on the treadmill. Even some studies that's been shown to increase muscle hypertrophy as well. Again, disuse atrophy in that, in that stage of rehab. Another question from uh, Sam Johnson. Uh, embolism risk is contraindicated for BFR usage, but this is a risk in all post-op patients as they are coming to us in rehab on DVT prophylaxis. How does this, how does the literature address this issue? That is a great, great question. Um, so the first thing I would say is Colin Bond, who was a lead author in a 2019 JOSPT article um, that was probably the most well-written article on the topic. And what they did was they looked at the uh, Virchow's triad. Virchow, apparently that's not how you say his name. 
but um, they looked at that triad and they related that to BFR in the current state of evidence. And what they concluded is that BFR itself it does not appear to be a risk factor post-surgery. It's the surgery itself that tends to be a risk factor because tourniquets have not been necessarily linked to increased blood clots. Although there is a paper that I have to read uh, that was released by, on my, that was looking at post-op total knees that was looking at uh, potentially not recommending a tourniquet for surgery, but, um, but I digress. Um, they basically showed that the current evidence that, that BFR does not promote clotting factors. It actually promotes fibrolytic factors, meaning it anti-clotting factors. Uh, and again, that has to do with some of this vascular shear stress that we're getting from the reperfusion and this upregulation of what we call tish, TPA or tissue plasma antigen that is released in levels similar to high intensity training. And one of the studies that was looking at that was by uh, 20, I think 2010 or somewhere, 20, 2006, I think. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it, unfortunately, the mo that is probably the most common question in, in that derivative of, of question is probably the most common that I get. And unfortunately, there is no specific return, uh, like, like post-operative guidelines. It's understanding the science behind what is potentially a, a risk factor for that individual and making a clinical judgment. Uh, typically, the larger the surgery, the more I would wait personally, just because there's more inflammation, there's more stuff underneath. But a post-op ACL, if I had the okay, I would get them on day, like literally day two, day three. You give one or two days for it to heat, for <clears throat> the, the inflammatory um, phase to kind of settle down and you start them off immediately because that quad is going to go and it's going to go real, real, real quick. So you want to try to get them in as early as possible. And those tend to also be those that are more healthy and have less comorbidities than somebody like a total knee replacement that is, you know, older and uh, it might not heal as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this it really comes down to the, the clinical judgment and collaboration with your referral sources. Like you can't make a unilateral decision. I mean, when I used to go and I, I used to talk with HSS, Hospital for Special Surgery, um, and their physicians, they would be like, their biggest fear was the, the physical therapist making a unilateral decision without at least consulting them on something like BFR. Uh, and I think that the times are changing whereby they're more open to now doing this as we get more evidence. And when this current paper gets published, uh, that's in peer review right now, they're going to be like, whoa, okay, this is like, uh, this is some good stuff uh, with the bone preservation um, and clinically, clinically applicable. Some of these research that study that, that's pu been published is not clinically, like you can't get somebody in five days a week unless you're a professional athlete. Some of these newer studies are using a frequency of two to three times a week, which makes it much more clinically relevant for, for, for us. So yeah, I would, I would refer to Bond 2019, JOSPT, uh, and, and really use that because that makes a very convincing case looking at the Virchow's triad and, and what, what BFR potentially does based on the current evidence and what we currently know about post-surgical risk six weeks. Cause that's the most, that six weeks is the most, is the time whereby you're, you're most likely to have a, a blood clot post-surgery, so. Mark, do you have anything else from Facebook or am I, am I uh, cut loose to ask a couple of questions? Well, you know, I did uh, post the Bond article and a few others that uh, Nick mentioned on the fly as he was, uh, throwing them out there. So check those out uh, in the comment thread. You'll be able to check those out. Those who are listening on the podcast, um, those will be linked in the, the show notes if you want to check them out. But uh, uh, as you can tell, Nick may know a little bit about the literature around BFR. Um, that's why we got him in here to, to talk to you guys tonight and also to, to talk to our uh, Lifelong Learning Academy members. We're excited for um, him to share. I'm already learned a ton and uh, looking forward to learning more, but uh, I do not have any further questions, Jared. I'll, I'll leave it to you because I know you're, you're drooling over there to, to, to pose some more questions. Well, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hold Nick up all night, but um, uh, there, there were, there were a couple of questions that, that popped into my head. I might save a couple of them for the, for the Q and A session after the master class. Uh, but one of, one of the ones that I was thinking right now is just, you know, how, how frequently do you run into a, a patient who is just aversive to, to BFR? For instance, 
uh, you know, you and I both know, anybody that's done it, uh, there is a tremendous, you know, muscular burn, localized muscle pain phenomenon. I personally enjoy it. I think it's great. I'm like, heck yeah, how much can I make this burn? This is awesome. But some patients might be like, uh, you know, this is not for me. How often do you have somebody that's aversive to it? And um, are there ways that you have that maybe help introduce that to people and kind of get them acclimated to it? So, yeah, I mean, that's literally the focus of the course um, is stratifying the three different patient types. So based on my experiences and the experiences that I've talked with others, I classify three different patient types, right? You were talking about the quitter, which is the person that's like very aversive that like you, you really got to be careful with your exercise prescription and understand what elevates perceptual demands in BFR training and what doesn't and what you could likely get away with to get them on board, right? Because ultimately at that decision, you've already decided that BFR is gonna help this person, but this person might be aversive to experiencing at least the full blown muscle burn that you're getting, you get with BFR right off the bat. So you need to be aware of the different perceptual uh, mediators that happen. So higher pressure, larger range of motion, um, you know, very wide cuffs, like there are all these different moderators that you can, you, you, you can understand that then say, all right, well, obviously, you know, if you have a cuff, you can't change the width of the cuff, but what can you do? You can change the pressure. You can also look at keeping the cuff inflated or deflated during the rest period, right? Just, just this morning, there was another paper published on intermittent BFR, which I hypothesized like a year and a half ago is going to be the new standard of BFR for the vast majority of people where you, you keep the exercise on, you kept, keep the cuff on during the exercise, but then you keep it off during the rest period such that the perceptual demands are on the, on the whole much lower because you're not sitting in that, you know, th that lactic acid burn uh, during the rest period. And, and, and so, yeah, I mean, it's understanding the mediators and the moderators that are going to affect the perceptual demand. So that's the quitter. You've already said that you're, you're what I am and what a couple of my other patients are is like the masochist, which you just love that burn and you just like want more of it. And you're just like, you're like, I just need it. And so those are the people that I program like walking lunges for, or the big, mo big range of motion, you know, uh, exercises, because those are going to be very stressful. And those are going to be the ones that are going to be, you know, are going to give them that burn that they, that they so crave and desire. And then the majority of people though, tend to be what I call the battlers, which are, they're like, eh, like I, I really, you know, I could do without the BFR, but you know what? You've told me that it's going to help me and it's going to get me to where I need to be. Uh, quicker than normal or quicker than other therapies, you know, so I'm going to go in and I'm going to battle and I'm going to get through this uh, because I want to reach my goals as fast as humanly possible. Right. And those people are the people that, yeah, you could pay attention to the pressure. You could, whatever, they're going to get it done. They're not going to be happy about it. They're going to let you know, like, oh, this sucks or whatever, but they're going to, they're going to get it done. And so it's really the, the masochist you have to worry about and the quitters because the quitters you want to make sure that you get them on board and you keep them on board. So maybe I'd start them out with passive BFR just to have them feel the cuff, right? And then I might be doing, if it's a knee pain patient, I might be doing short arc quads or isometrics, right? Or pair it with a little bit of e, uh, low load E-stim, low intensity E-stim. And then I'll grade them to an unloaded knee extension and then maybe add a little bit of load and then get them in a mini squat, right? Because after a couple of sessions, you know, I, I prefer to say single joint and then go to multi-joint after, you know, a couple of weeks. Um, and then, and then, yeah. And then you have the opposite end, you have the masochist that they're going to do like one of them that I've trained, like he was like, can I do the whole session with BFR? Like 45 minutes. He just wants to have his biceps and then he feels the bicep burn while he's doing the leg exercises and then calf exercise. And then pretty soon his whole body's on fire and he's like, I'll, I'm alive. I've never felt this way since I was like 25. That's a real quote. Um, and so you need to rein them in because what we understand about the, there's a couple of different things, but really the main thing is from a hypertrophy perspective, you don't want to have afferent activity, uh, meaning that you have these sensors that are around your muscle that sense this metabolic burn and they communicate with your brain. And basically the longer they're on 
and, and, and creating, you know, this, this signal, the more likely you are to, to experience central fatigue and central fatigue is just a down regulation of your, your muscle fibers it, that could happen distal to the site. So for example, you can have quad, you can have quad exercise, but then you can also have a decreased ability to recruit your high threshold motor into your biceps, right? Cause everything is linked to your brain. So your brain's like, Oh, I got to deal with this. You know, it's not going to allow you to fully recruit your biceps. So even though you think you're getting a great workout, you're, you're not, um, you're not getting as effective of, of a workout. Um, and so, you know, and that's not even to mention that the afferent's role is to increase blood pressure, heart rate response. So like when they're active, you are going to continue to have an elevation in those, uh, those markers. So if you have somebody that might be a more at risk for an exaggerated response, you might not necessarily want to have them, you know, light up their whole body with lactic acid and, and like, you know, it's enjoy that. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's rationales for, for, for that, but we, again, that's why it's important to understand what, what increases discomfort, but also being comfortable, letting your, your patients know that, Hey, this is not going to be comfortable. Like, but when you do know that when it's not comfortable, that's actually when you're getting benefit for the exercise. And if you can push through that and, and, and really try to try to really exert yourself, then you know that you're going to fire up the machinery that's going to be responsible for all those positive adaptations that you're looking to elicit in a long-term rehab program. Awesome, man. Uh, I do have one question from Brett, Brett Halpert about is, do you have any recommendations on the, uh, let's see, the cheapest cuff you would recommend? It would really depend on the, the setting. Um, so I can't say that practical BFR, you know, I, I don't necessarily formally recommend practical BFR, meaning tying a wrap around your arm only because the data shows that it's not reliable. So over a, you know, Lenicky's group, which his group has done a lot of the, uh, the, the, the work, he, their, their group is the workhorse of all the methodological stuff regarding BFR applications. So what they did was pretty ingenious. They took a pneumatic cuff, so you like a blood pressure cuff kind of um, designed for BFR, and they blindfolded individuals and they had them inflate to a percentage or to what they would think was a seven out of 10 pressure in their arms and in their, in their legs. And they did that over three days. And that's what the practical BFR would be, right? It would be instead of pneumatic, right? Because they wanted to standardize it to at least something so they can get a pressure value. They, you, you wrap around with wraps. What they found was over the course of three days, over or underestimation of the pressure, apply pressure by up to 25%. So if you're looking at, I mean, you're looking at that wide range of pressures, that is a wide range of potential occlusion, which is another discussion. Does, does, uh, does absolute occlusion matter? But more for me, it's, it's potentially super occlusive. And now you're working, you're exercising at full occlusion, which would increase your risk of getting a blood clot. Um, and so, you know, like I don't necessarily recommend practical, but if you're in a fitness professional, you know, and you technically have, have no comorbidities and you're working with people that don't have any comorbidities, which in America, probably not, um, uh, then yeah, then go ahead and go practical. Um, you know, I like, uh, you know, I've been having experience right now with, uh, with all the different cuffs, a couple hundred bucks. You can either get H plus cuffs, fit cuffs, or, uh, smart tools is another one. Um, their new cuff, which is pretty, pretty good. Um, I've been using it now for the last week and a half, two weeks, um, is, is awesome. It also auto regulates the pressure. So if you need to use it in the clinical setting, uh, I think it's like 1500 bucks, um, but that might be a little expensive for personal use. So manual costs right now are, are, are where it's at. You have two, 300 bucks, you can get a nice set um, of manual costs, but then you're going to need to use something to standardize the pressure. So you have a pulse ox has been shown to have some promise, although it's a little finicky, um, like with skin color, nail polish, some of the other limitations of using a pulse oximeter will apply to standardizing the pressure with BFR. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, like I, I tend to avoid direct recommendations for individual cuffs and I leave it to the consumer to try to, uh, determine what, what, 
may fit their needs. Um, but there's a lot of good cuffs out there. And the cuffs that I highlight in my workshop, uh, in my um, BFR course, are the ones that I've used and at least will serve a purpose for uh, BFR, um, which in the clinical setting or in the, uh, the fitness setting. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Nick, I just wanted to thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, Jared and I have really appreciated um, jumping on with us tonight. And then of course, jumping on with us in our uh, membership. Um, for those of you who are listening, and obviously you can tell Nick knows what the hell he's talking about, but he's, he's walking PubMed of BFR, like the guy's probably throwing about a hundred citations out, which it tells me we picked uh, you know, a good guy to come and talk about it. And that's why we've, we've followed Nick. We've seen what he's been doing on social media I'm um, going actually like uh, put some science behind it, putting um, some serious work and grind into really diving deep. I mean, he's probably as deep as anybody I've talked to who's dove, dove into the BFR world. Um, so we're looking forward to hearing you talk in the membership. If you're interested in listening to Nick talk about it, um, we'll put a link into our lifelong learning community. Check it out. You can get a 14 day free trial. If you just listen to Nick's talk and that's it, you, you can cancel it. But uh, we have, you know, a bun bunch of other master classes, Peter O'Sullivan, um, you know, Morton Hugh, a bunch of good folks out there who've done, who've come on and, and talk with us. So um, we're excited for Nick, for you to join uh, the list of folks that are in uh, masterclass deliverers and um, anything else you want to leave folks with before we wrap up tonight? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you want to, uh, to check out my Instagram, uh, the BFR pros or the HPM, I uh, have some stuff. Uh, I'm transitioning more of my BFR content to the BFR pros though. But if you scroll down on the HPM, you'll see some, some a, well, a lot of BFR content, probably like 300 plus posts. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're interested in taking the course, I can, um, at least anybody listening to this podcast, I can go get them a uh, $75 off the, the course and uh, they'll get some CEUs if you're a rehab or fitness provider. And, uh, you know, it's a pretty well-reviewed course. And I don't say that because uh, I'm biased. I just say it because our feedback. So, so, um, so it's, it's, and it has everything you need to. Like, um, you know, we added, uh, like, people don't think that they need li waivers, liability stuff. Uh, we added that. We paid a lawyer uh, an absurd amount of money to, to draft something like that. We also have programming and uh, obviously cup discounts. So I don't take any commissions for any cuffs ever because that would potentially sacrifice my academic integrity. I already have to, to, uh, to declare that I spoke on behalf of one of the one, BFR on one of the cuff companies in, in a London trip that I took in 2019. So like, I, I just, I'm done with that because uh, I don't want people to think that anything that I'm putting out there is biased in any way, shape or form. It's just about getting BFR, uh, getting B BFR out in the mainstream and uh, getting good information out there. Um, and that's what the course will, will deliver for you. Um, so, yeah. And that's on BFRtraining.com. Awesome, man. We'll throw some links up for that. Uh, definitely appreciate you extending that, that discount out to people. And, uh, you know, haven't known you for a long time and, and, and chatted, you know, multiple times over social media and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, I, I haven't taken the course yet myself, uh, but I, I feel pretty confident saying that I know that it's high quality. I know that it's, uh, I know it's going to provide a lot of value to whoever takes it. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, absolutely. Echo that. So check out uh, Nick's Instagram, uh, BFR Pros stuff as well. And uh, he'll have some opportunities for you to, to dive deeper into it. Those from the masterclass, he'll have some opportunities um, for you as well, if you're going to check that out. Um, but hope to see you guys there next Tuesday, I believe. I can't remember the exact time. We'll, we'll put that up on uh, our, our pages here just to let you guys know when Nick's going to be speaking if you want to jump in and check it out. Um, but I'll, I'll leave everybody with that. Hope you guys enjoyed the talk. Uh, put any questions in the comments. Uh, I'll, we'll post those to Nick and push them on. If he can answer them, he'll, he'll respond back to you guys. So have a good rest of your evening, everybody.